Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Vicki Marks. I'm president of APDR, and I want to welcome you to our uh, virtual noon conference series. Um, a few housekeeping items before we get started. This webinar is being recorded. Um, in addition to questions that are submitted, um, if there's time after the end of the talks to answer questions live, uh, we will do that. And if not, the uh, questions will be uh, sent to the speakers uh, and answers delivered to you electronically. Um, if you do have questions, use the question and answer tool. Um, and I think it's time to rock and roll. Uh, next slide. Uh, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. The first speaker is Diana Litmanovich. She's an associate professor of radiology and director of cardiothoracic imaging at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. And our second speaker is Prachi Agarwal, a professor of radiology and director of cardiothoracic imaging at the University of Michigan. Um, I wanna thank them both for their dedication to graduate medical education and to this specific program during a very difficult time uh, for all of us. Uh, so now I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Litmanovich, who can share her slides. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for being invited into such an important initiative. It's my pleasure to be here today and to talk about the cardiovascular imaging considerations in pregnancy. I would like to start talking about uh, the cardiovascular imaging in pregnancy. So the maternal mortality is known to be rising in the United States. And if you think about it, 27 out of 100,000 live birth deaths, it's a very high number when we are talking about young and healthy women. Part of this reason is because there is an increasing average age of uh, uh, the uh, pregnant women, but also because of uh, the uh, very complex population of patients who did not who did not have the opportunity to be pregnant and gave birth, including uh, patients with adult congenital heart disease. So this all together combines uh, into a big group of cardiopulmonary diseases, which are as of now the most common cause of death overall in pregnancy. Imaging during pregnancy, the cardiovascular imaging is used for two reasons to diagnose the life-threatening condition during pregnancy, and also to do risk stratification for mother and fetus, especially if uh, the uh, age of pregnancy is early. Imaging should, obtained, should be obtained only if it cannot be postponed. And I think if you can take a, a take-home message from this talk, this is one of those take-home messages. So we only do imaging if it cannot be postponed during pregnancy. Now, I would focus primarily on CT and MRI imaging during pregnancy, and I will talk about the safety considerations for both of those modalities. How do we do the adjustment of the protocols? Uh, what are the most common indications during pregnancy for CT and for MR? And what are the suggested algorithms for imaging? So let's start with safety considerations. And first, I would like to talk about the safety considerations in the CT. The unique nature of imaging in pregnancy is that we are imaging two in one. We're imaging mother and fetus simultaneously. We are talking about radiation exposure to fetus, but we should not forget the radiation exposure to the mother. We are administering contrast material, and we should think about also the consequences for lactation if it is obtained in postpartum period. When we are thinking about mechanisms of ionizing radiation during the cardiothoracic imaging with CT, we are talking about the scattered radiation. So there is no direct radiation to the fetus. We are not imaging the abdomen. We are imaging the chest. And that's why the radiation that the fetus is receiving is only scattered with substantial attenuation through the mother soft tissues. That's why when we talk about fetal radiation, we are talking about the two options, the stochastic effect, which is associated with carcinogenesis, where we don't have a threshold. In other words, there is no radiation that is considered safe. Any type, any amount of radiation can potentially lead to a stochastic effect or carcinogenesis. But we know from multiple animal studies and atomic bomb survivor studies that approximately 50 milligray, and I will encourage you to remember this number, I'll come back to that later, 50 milligray of exposure are associated with increasing the relative risk for childhood cancer twice. 
On the other hand, when we are talking about deterministic effect of radiation or teratogenesis, when we are talking about the fetus, we have certain thresholds. Below 100 milligrams, and again, another number to remember, no adverse effect level. Between 100 and 150, there are potential effects for gonogenesis, and more than 200, they are so likely that determination of pregnancy should be considered. Now, let's look at the radiation dose delivered to the fetus through the cardiovascular imaging, through chest CTA, chest CT, or coronary CTA. So remember the 50 milligram? So here we are talking about a totally different magnitude of radiation exposure to fetus. So instead of 50 milligray, the medical radiation, the cardio, uh, uh, cardiothoracic imaging, the radiation would be going up to at most two millisieverts, which is substantially less than the 50 millisievert for stochastic effect that we were talking about, and also for organogenesis. Now, we used to talk about fetal radiation when we talk about pregnancy, but I would like to actually talk about maternal radiation, which as you will see now is very important as well, if not even more important. Breast tissue is extremely sensitive to radiation. Estimated breast radiation, if no precautions are uh, taken, can actually be equivalent to more than 10 mammograms. And that might exceed the lifetime excess for relative risk of breast cancer by 1%. We are talking about a young patient with a very sensitive breast during pregnancy. So what can we do? First of all, we need to reduce the radiation uh, by adjusting the protocol. The MAS should be low. The KVP should be low. When I say low, I mean 100. And in the overwhelming majority of the patients, those numbers will be sufficient to obtain a very good image quality. Be very minded to imaging appropriate Z-axis. We're not including the apices of the lungs. We're only doing it until the diaphragm. Uh, sorry, until the diaphragm. Now, what we also do for pregnant patients, and uh, uh, that has been shown very uh, as uh, being very protective, is we give pregnant patients oral barium for internal shielding. Being accumulated in the stomach, this barium does not let the scattered radiation to go from the chest into the abdomen to the fetus. And the measurements that we have obtained while doing it with phantom were essentially equal to zero. This is one of the experiments that we made using a phantom. And as you can see, the radiation to the pelvis, doesn't matter what uh, protocol we are talking about, was less than 0.2 milligray. So more than 100 times less than the threshold of 50 milligray that I have been mentioning previously. The other potential option to talk about uh, saving radiation for the mother would be a reduced current region dose modulation. In other words, when the tube is rotating around the breast, the radiation is decreased. If you look at this uh, green triangle, at this area, the radiation would be lower than for the rest of the circumference. That sounds it's a very promising modality, and it's indeed promising. This is what it would be equivalent to on the CT images. This is the area where the radiation is decreased. Unfortunately, if no precautions are taken, what we have shown in a different study, that in a, a substantial number of patients, breast tissue can lay down outside of this reduced dose zone. So that's why if you have patient and if you that is especially pregnant, and if you have this particular type of, of dose reduction, organ specific dose reduction, you have to make sure that this patient breast is within those fields of decreased radiation. And the best way to do it is by simply asking the patient to wear a bra. And sometimes you can potentially use the materials that will fix the breast in a particular location anteriorly at the body's surface. Let's talk about iodine contrast. It crosses the placenta, it's excreted by fetal kidneys. There is a theoretic potential to produce neonatal hypothyroidism, but no effects have been reported so far from the iodine contrast that was used for imaging. ACR in 2010 has concluded that the contrast media may be given to pregnant patients if needed. Now, if iodine has been administered, neonatal thyroid function should be checked. But in the United States, every neonate, every newborn has his thyroid function checked anyway. So that's not a problem. Now, 
if the imaging has happened right after the delivery in the postpartum period when the person when the mother is still uh, uh, breastfeeding, there is no need to interrupt lactation because the amount of iodine contrast that has been excreted into the breast milk is approximately 1,000 of the concentration in the blood. So it's extremely low. It might cause more harm and interruption of lactation than uh, there is uh, the potential to, core, uh, to cause harm. There is essentially no harm, so no need to interrupt lactation. Let's now talk about the MRI and the safety considerations which are related to MRI. Again, we are talking about the two-in-one imaging. We're imaging two patients at the same time. And we know that the magnetic field uh, related safety issues for fetus are important to consider. We'll talk about the administration of the gadolinium and again, the consequences of lactation. So the ACR white paper on MRI safety states that pregnant patients should undergo MRI only if the required information cannot be obtained via other non-ionizing means, which essentially leaves us with ultrasound. In other words, if we cannot do ultrasound for whatever question, then we can do an MR. Uh, and the information has to be very likely to alter patient care. So if you obtain a particular information that not necessarily is gonna affect patient care during pregnancy, then wait until the pregnancy is over. And also it has to be done if the examination cannot wait until after completion of pregnancy. And why we are concerned? Because there are certain safety considerations to the fetus related to the MRI. The first one is the static MRI field damage. It can affect cell migration, proliferation, and differentiation in theory. Now, the pulsed radiofrequency field can cause tissue heating, and the varying gradient electromagnetic field can cause potential damage to fetal ear due to high acoustic noise level. Now, there is no scientific evidence in humans of teratogenesis seen up to 14 years after MRI examination in utero. So the static MRI field potential damage has not been documented. If we think about tissue heating, the majority of the heating is superficial. When we are talking about the tissue heating in general in MRI, we are operating with SAR units, specific absorption rate units, which are regulated by FDA, and we know that they should be less than two watts per kilogram. The SAR units do not currently exist for pregnant patients, but to avoid potential overheating, it is a <clears throat> consensus which is widely known that we are not imaging pregnant patients with three Tesla, but rather with 1.5 Tesla, and the internal heating is absorbed by the maternal body. So the uh, experiment that we've done on the Phantom have demonstrated that for procedures which are complained with International Electrotechnical Commission normal mode condition, those imaging modalities uh, of MRI do not cause internal heating that would exceed the limits of the star units being less than two watts per kilogram. Let's talk about the noise. As we all know, the noise in the MRI suit can be excruciatingly loud, but the fetal noise after attenuation by maternal body does not exceed 30 decibels, which is substantially low than the 90 decibel limit, which is established by the American Academy of Pediatricians for potential cause of damage to the fetal ear. So we are not talking about scientific evidence in humans of acoustic damage to the fetus. Let's talk about the MRI. The, uh, sorry, let's talk about the gadolinium. Gadolinium crosses the placenta and it's excreted by fetal kidneys. It accumulates in amniotic fluid and there were evidence of sporadic, sporadic evidence of animal teratogenesis only when the doses were high and repeated. The concentration in the fetus is 100 times less than in the mother and there was no teratogenesis documented uh, in the humans. The association between MRI exposure during pregnancy and fetal and childhood outcomes has been studied probably in the largest currently existing database by the Canadian Association uh, and published in JAMA. And what they looked at and found that the uh, for first trimester MRI exposure, the risk of stillbirth 
or neonatal days within the 20 age of birth and any congenital anomaly, neoplasm, and hearing of vision loss was evaluated from birth to four years. The results of this uh, study are very interesting. They have studied almost one and a half million deliveries, which is an enormous database. They followed them up for 12 years. And one in 250 had an MRI in pregnancy, one in 1,200 had it in first trimester, and one in 3,000 had it with gadolinium contrast. What it showed is that non-gadolinium MRI during the first trimester had no any influence on the harm to the fetus. The gadolinium MRI at any time during pregnancy has been associated with increased risk of certain conditions and also increased risk of stillbirth or neonatal deaths. There was no increased risk of NSF-like outcomes and no increase in teratogenesis. Although those results are not in favor of using the delinium in pregnancy, we have to remember that to begin with, those patients who underwent gadolinium, MRI, gadolinium enhanced MRI were at potentially substantially more serious condition than the ones who did not have gadolinium administered. So although it's a very uh, much uh, alarming and um, important note for us, we have to remember that this study uh, investigated women in different stages of their health for that particular purpose. So as of now, the gadolinium is considered category C agent. What does it mean? It means that it should not be administered if the potential benefit justifies the potential risk to the fetus. And what is important for you as trainees, as residents, is to remember that there has to be a clinical discussion that has to be documented. And informed consent, and I'll come back to that later, informed consent should be obtained. And if we use gadolinium, we should use agents which are considered low NSF risk. Now, if gadolinium has been administered to the fetus, there is no need to do neonatal tests, and there is no need to interrupt lactation for reasons similar to no need to interrupt lactation after administration of iodine contrast. The concentration in the breast milk is minuscule. Okay, now what can we do to adjust the protocols? So the challenges are the altered hemodynamics. In CT, we are talking about dilution of volume. The plasma volume is increasing, the cardiac output is increasing, there is a severe Valsalva effect. So what can we do? We have to do three things. We have to administer IV contrast with very high injection rate in pregnant patients. It's important to couch them on proper breathing instructions. And it's very important to do the studies fast with a high pH of more than one. This is an example of a patient who was 22 weeks pregnant with shortness of breath. The suspicion was pulmonary embolism. And indeed, she has a pulmonary embolism and she also has a pulmonary infarct. If you look at her CT, you can see that with uh, uh, administration of IV contrast and proper breathing instructions, we have managed to have a very good quality study. And it also was done according to all those safety radiation parameters that we have discussed earlier. Another patient, 36 years old, 24 weeks pregnant, she was involved in MBA. The question was trauma. We didn't see any traumatic uh, effect, but what we did see is a very hypertrophic right ventricle. And we did see a connection between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. So we did find that this patient had a patent ductus arteriosus. The challenges in MRI is the difficulty for breath holding on multiple sequences because it takes time. And it's also the discomfort of laying supine or prone for extended period of time for a patient who is pregnant. And also that we cannot administer gadolinium until we absolutely have to. So how can we address those challenges? The answer is to focus right away on the main clinical question and to do the fast non-gadolinium protocols which are available, such as SFFP, the free breathing sequences, and the fast 3D acquisition. And again, it cannot be over uh, stressed and overemphasized. We have to give gadolinium only if it is absolutely necessary. 
So there is a paper that came out from the uh, European uh, Heart Association that talks about the summary of the recommendations for cardiac MR in pregnancy that I will encourage everybody to uh, read it if you're involved in imaging of pregnant patients with, uh, with MRI in general and with cardiac MRI in particular, that gives a very nice summary of the adjustment that needs to be done. This is an example of a patient that uh, was imaged with 3D SSFP. The acquisition took five minutes and you can see here the correct transposition of the great arteries being imaged very nicely uh, without the administration of gadolinium and uh, with a very short uh, overall duration of the imaging. So what are the most common indications for cardiovascular imaging in pregnancy? We talked about the safety aspects. We talked about how we adjust the protocols. Now let's talk about who and why should get this imaging. So if we are talking about CT, the majority would be for aortic imaging, trauma or dissection. The second one will be the pulmonary artery imaging for suspected pulmonary embolism. And now again, given the increasing age, increasing average age of the maternal population, we are talking about imaging of the coronary arteries when the index of suspicion is low or indeterminate. And the patient has a high index of suspicion for coronary event, she most likely will be taken directly into the cath lab. This is an example of a patient who was 26 year old. She was 30 weeks, uh, 34 weeks pregnant, and she came with the chest pain. Uh, her index of suspicion for coronary artery disease was low. Nevertheless, she underwent a CT, and CT has demonstrated spontaneous coronary artery dissection with creation of the pseudoaneurysm. You can see the pseudoaneurysm on CT. The patient was taken to cath, and you can also see the pseudoaneurysm on cath. In between, there was an echocardiography done, and you can see the flow within the pseudoaneurysm. So this is an example of a very specific, rare in general, but more common in pregnancy complications, such as spontaneous coronary artery dissection. This patient has a similar pathology, also 38-year-old, uh, one week postpartum, came with a chest pain. The index of suspicion for coronary artery disease was intermediate. And what we see here is a coronary artery dissection, and we also see the hyperperfusion of the myocardium because of the uh, dissection being present, compromising the perfusion to the entire anterior wall of the left ventricle. For the MRI, uh, the indications for the, uh, for the study during pregnancy are aortic pathology, maternal congenital cardiovascular abnormalities, or myocardial malfunction. The uh, study published by Harry and colleagues has demonstrated the that the cardiac MR during pregnancy can substantially alter the course of the treatment and intervention compared to echo. And this is the first study of it, its kind actually showing the qualitative intervention that the cardiac MRI can do in pregnancy, really affecting the course and the outcome of pregnancy. This is a patient with aortic dissection. The study was done using steady state free precession. This is a rare complication, but when it happens, it can cause 10% of maternal deaths during pregnancy. There are certain parameters that increase the risk of dissection, such as a known bicuspid aortic valve, coarctation or collagen vascular disease. If it happens, it's more frequent in third trimester or peripartum, and the cardiac MR is ideal for diagnosis and for assessment of the extent of the aortic dissection. This is a patient that has presented with subacute intramural hematoma during the third trimester. You can appreciate the extent. And the hematoma has resolved as the imaging postpartum has demonstrated. This patient not only had the intramural hematoma, but also had a type B dissection that can easily be seen uh, on the imaging and was uh, unchanged on postpartum imaging as well. What is also important is to assess the dimensions of the aorta and the risk of dissection in patients with aortic dilatation or aneurysm. 
The non-contrast MRA gives us an opportunity to do the measurements precisely. And we know that the patients with uh, bicuspid aortic valve are at much higher risk if their, if their diameter of the aorta is five centimeters or more. And if the patient has connective tissue disorders such as Marfan, this risk is very high above 45 millimeters. And if we uh, see those uh, findings uh, in the first trimester of pregnancy, termination of pregnancy might be even considered. So in patients with congenital heart disease, the key information that needs to be taken uh, by cardiac MR is the function of the systemic ventricle, severity of pulmonary hypertension if present, and also the status of conduits and baffles and anastomosis. We also can look into the function of the pulmonary aortic valve and looking for uh, mainly presence of obstructing lesions that would cause a substantial gradient of more than 30 uh, millimeters. This is an example of uh, a patient that uh, had a coarctation and had a stent and presented with hypertension. We see the first image demonstrates the non gadolinium MRA, and the second one is T1 weighted F FSE. And what we see that when we assess the flow and compare the proximal and distal flow with velocity encoded CNA MRI, there is no collateral flow, which means that this uh, the conduit is patent. So we were able to do it without administration of gadolinium. Suggested algorithms for cardiovascular imaging in pregnancy are very important, especially again, uh, when you are a trainee, when you are seeing this patient, especially after hours, when you're on call, and when you need to have an algorithm to follow to know how you proceed with imaging of pregnant patients. So this is a suggested CT algorithm in pregnancy. And the main important thing here are the two ones which I have circled in red. The discussion has to happen between the radiologist, attending or trainee, and the clinician. And the first question that we ask is, can the study be postponed? If the decision is to proceed with the study and not to postpone it, then we have to obtain informed consent from the patient after a thorough discussion with the patient and addressing all the questions that this patient might have particularly talking about the radiation dose to the fetus, the radiation dose to the mother, and also all the precautions that are going to be taken when the patient is being scanned for optimizing the radiation dose. And then the study has to be done with all the optimization of the protocol that we have discussed earlier. When we are talking about the MRI algorithm in pregnancy, the suggested cardiac MRI algorithm in pregnancy. Again, we are talking about the discussion. The question is if the study can be postponed and we have to talk about the uh, with patient and obtain an informed consent. And then the study is done with the uh, alterations and with the adjustment that we talked about without administration of gadolinium using short uh, imaging uh, sequences and going straight to the point where the major question is. Consent is essential. We consent for all but ultrasound studies, and we find that extremely important and also very reassuring for the patient. And the patient arrives to the scanning much more relaxed, and the quality of the scans has increased since we have introduced the informed consent. Uh, every radiology and cardiology facility should have the process for evaluating pregnant women according to an algorithm. And again, the discussion with the patient about the risks and benefits is absolutely essential and has to be documented in the radiology report. In summary, the CT and MRI are very useful modalities and they are justified in specific clinical scenarios for cardiotrophic imaging. The adjustments of the protocols is essential. The non-contrast MRI technique should be used in the majority of the cases until unless absolutely necessary to use gadolinium. There were no adverse mother fetal effects documented as of now. And we should be aware not only of fetal radiation, but also of maternal, specifically breast radiation. 
And I cannot overemphasize the importance of informed consent. It is mandatory in the imaging of patients who are pregnant. And with that, I would like to thank you again for inviting me to speak at this important venue. And uh, I would like to answer any questions if they are there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Litmanovitz. That, uh, that was a great presentation. I've learned a lot.